These are the 10 ugliest military jets. This list was compiled using the Mooch tally, which regular viewers of the channel know is a proprietary algorithm using data to determine the ranking of each airplane. In the case of this list, there are three variables, each with a value between one and 10. The first is ugliness. If you were to enter a hangar and see the airplane for the first time, what would your reaction be? The first variable is reduced by the second, which is mission capability. Regardless of how ugly an airplane is, how did it perform operationally over its service life? And the third variable is subscriber input, which is based on the number of mentions a jet got in the channel community tab comments section. So you take the first number, subtract the second, and then add the third, and you get the ranking. Remember, as with previous lists in the history of the channel, the Mooch tally is an opinion. It's science. Science! So let's get to it. At number 10 is the F-94 Starfire. As a first-generation jet-powered interceptor, the F-94 Starfire can be forgiven for being less than impressive in the looks department than the airplanes that came right after it, like the F-86. Aero engineers were still wrestling with the unintended consequences of being able to go faster than 350 knots, and they tended to overcompensate in their designs. The Starfire is a perfect example of this. The nose is too long, because along with a gun, it hosted an early air-to-air -air radar that was only effective in the terminal phase of an intercept. The wings are too straight and too long, and the intakes and the control surfaces on the tail are too small. The Starfire gets a 6 for ugliness, but that's more than offset by a 7 for mission capability including the fact it was the first American jet with an afterburner. During its brief 10 years of service, it was used extensively by both the Air Force and the Air National Guard in the interceptor and reconnaissance roles, and is credited with multiple kills during the Korean War, including the first nighttime air-to-air -air kill against a MiG-15. And it gets one for a couple of subscriber mentions in the channel community tab. All of that adds up to a mooch tally of zero. At number nine is the Yak-38. Ugly and vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL, seem to go together, but the Yak-38 NATO codename Forger was exceptionally so. The fuselage had a strange downward curve to it and looked chubby in combination with the stubby wings and short vertical stabilizer. All of those things add up to a 6 for ugliness, but that's offset by a 7 for mission performance based on the technological first that went into the design, including an ejection system that would automatically fire during a hover if there was a single engine failure that caused the airplane to roll more than 60 degrees near the ground. The Forger also served the Soviet Navy on a number of classes of ships for more than 20 years. And the Yak-38 gets a 2 for the mentions it got in the channel community tab comments. That adds up to a mooch tally of 1. At number eight is the Saab 29 Tunan. The Tunan, which is Swedish for barrel, was as ugly as the name implies. The Tunan was developed immediately following World War II. It was only the second jet Sweden built and the first one designed to be a jet at the outset. The fat body was combined with thin swept wings to allow it to fly as fast as possible, and that disproportion added to the jet's awkward appearance. The thin wings forced designers to have the landing gear extend and retract from the fuselage, which added to the Saab 29's ugliness on deck. The tail extended beyond the exhaust nozzle, which made it easier to land, but even weirder looking. The Tunan gets a 7 for ugliness, offset by a 6 for mission capability, due to the fact the jet held the world speed record in the mid-50s and was used by the Swedish Air Force as a fighter, trainer, and target towing aircraft for more than 25 years. And it gets a 1 for the number of mentions received in the channel community tab comments. All of that gives the Saab 29 Tunan a mooch tally of 2. At number 7 is the A7 Corsair II. Take an elegant fighter, the F-8 Crusader, shorten the fuselage and wings and widen the intake, and you get the A7 Corsair II, a less than elegant attack aircraft. The A7 was used by the U.S. Air Force and U.S. Navy in the light attack role. It was a workhorse in carrier air wings for over 20 years, not only as a conventional bomber, but also in the suppression of enemy air defenses role firing harm missiles and as an airborne tanker. It was also the first U.S. Navy fleet aircraft to have a heads-up display. The A-7 was often referred to as the slough, which stands for short little ugly <laughs> It gets a 7 for ugliness. That's equally offset by a 7 for mission capability, owing to the jet's operational performance over its service life. It saw combat from Vietnam through Desert Storm, including contingency operations like El Dorado Cannon in Libya and Praying Manus in the Persian Gulf in between. And the A7 gets three for subscriber input with a couple of mentions in the channel community tab comments. All of that gets the A7 a mooch tally of three. And number six is the A6 Intruder. The A6 Intruder served the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps well from the Vietnam War through Desert Storm. 
It was designed for all-weather bombing, and to accomplish that, it had a powerful air-to-ground radar in the bulbous nose and side-by-side seating in the cockpit to facilitate crew coordination between the pilot and bombardier navigator. Those features, along with a non-retractable refueling probe, gave the intruder a front that looked too wide for the back. The intruder gets an 8 for ugliness, and that's offset by an 8 for mission capability, which it gets for decades of operating from aircraft carrier flight decks in hostile areas and putting bombs on target when it mattered most. And the A6 gets a 4 for subscriber input for a handful of mentions in the comments of the community tab. So the intruder earns a mooch tally of 4. Okay, before we get to number 5, check this out. Hey everybody, I'm here on the Naval Academy grounds to talk to you about the channel real quick. Now, believe it or not, nearly 70% of you who watch the channel frequently are not subscribed. So I'd encourage you to hit the subscribe button now. This will allow me to continue to grow the channel and bring you more of the type of episodes that you've enjoyed for the last three years. Thank you. And number five is the A-10 Thunderbolt II, better known as the Warthog. The A-10 Thunderbolt II is a classic example of function over form. It was built from the ground up for close air support with both lethality and battlefield survivability in mind. Here's an excerpt from one of the channel's most popular episodes where Colonel Casey Campbell describes the airplane's features. I think the awesome thing that I love about the A-10 is, well, obviously the 30 millimeter Gatling gun, but the airplane is built around the gun. So the gun itself is 19 feet long and you can't really see the wheel on this one, but if you look at an A-10 straight on, the gun is going to be the very center of the airplane. So where we point is where we shoot, which means that the nose wheel is actually slightly offset. So the next time you see an A-10 out there, you'll see that the nose wheel is, is offset, but, uh, Pretty incredible airplane. I mean, really designed for the close air support mission. Um, our fuel tanks are enclosed in protective foam lining. So the fuel tanks are on the wing. Uh, wing sections are in protective foam lining to prevent fire after battle damage. Uh, obviously, we have two very reliable engines. We like to poke at our single seat fighter uh, engine friends uh, that we have two. They're very reliable, very durable. Um, and then all of our flight controls are built with redundant backup systems. So um, left and right hydraulic lines are separated throughout the aircraft. Awesome airplane has 11 stations, 11 pylons to uh, carry weapons. So uh, we can occasionally get that full load out with a full gun and then full load of weapons with uh, whether it's AIM-9s for, uh, we'll call it defense of an air-to-air -air mission, uh, rockets, Maverick missiles, bombs. Now with the upgraded A-10C, we'll carry uh, laser guided bombs, GPS guided bombs. Um, but in the early days, it was just dumb bombs. Um, and then uh, um, we can also carry, which you can kind of see over here is an electronic countermeasure pod. So full load out uh, makes us very heavy, talking like 47,000 pounds uh, of an airplane fully loaded, uh, which in the summers in uh, Afghanistan or Las Vegas at Nellis Air Force Base uh, makes us pretty uh, heavy rolling down that runway. So this is a 30 millimeter bullet. This is a target pack practice round. You can tell by the blue tip, um, but this is, and it's inert just for the record, uh, <laughs> but this is what a 30 millimeter round looks like. Um, and uh, I mean, these, the shells, so this, um, when we shoot uh, the 30 millimeter round, we'll, the shells come back in the airplane. Um, so we end up recycling the shells, but Pretty awesome. There are uh, several different types of rounds that we can carry. So we've got um, essentially a high explosive incendiary round. Um, we have the target practice rounds. We have an armor piercing uh, round as well. Um, and we do also have what we call a combat mix where we'll combine different types of rounds, but very effective. Uh, we shoot about 70 rounds per second um, in the A-10. Um, in combat, maybe a couple second burst is really all, you, all that you need. Those features add up to make an exceptionally weird looking airplane, which is how it earned its nickname Warthog. The Warthog gets a nine for ugliness, but that's offset by an eight for mission capability. The A-10's ability to get troops on the ground out of a jam was demonstrated repeatedly during Desert Storm and the post 9-11 wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And it gets five for subscriber input for several mentions in the community tab comments. So the Mooch tally for the A-10 comes out to six. At number four are the British V-bombers. For this list, we've lumped all the British V-bombers into a single entry. All look like they were designed using the spiral notebook doodles of a fifth grader bored during math class. 
The V-Bombers share the same aesthetic, which blends the fuselage and wings, giving a look that seems to defy the laws of physics to fly. Look at the curve along the leading edge of the Vulcan's wing. I'm sure an engineer designed it that way on purpose, but it looks like it was drawn freehand. They get a collective 7 for ugliness, and that's slightly mitigated by a 3 for mission capability, which is not because of their decades of service as RAF bombers, but specifically because the Victor was converted into a reliable air refueling platform. And V-Bombers get a 4 for subscriber input for several mentions in the comments section of the community tab. So the V-Bombers earn a mooch tally of 8. And number 3 is the F-7U Cutlass. The Vought F-7U Cutlass was the first tailless jet in the U.S. inventory, as well as the U.S. Navy's first swept-wing jet and the first with afterburner. In spite of the fact that all three prototypes crashed during testing, the Navy went ahead and fielded the Cutlass as their frontline carrier-based fighter. But underpowered Westinghouse J-34s and an unreliable hydraulic flight control system led to troubles, particularly when flying around the boat. Here we see some examples of that. All right, we'll start with a quote-unquote normal pass here. Safely aboard, good trap. Note how the canopy is open during case one ops. Okay, in this one, the guy's trolling, coming in pretty low, and winds up hook-skipping over all the wires into the barricade. And Hancock was a straight deck carrier, no angled deck. The airplane stops very close to the airplanes parked on cats one and two see the same pass from vultures row here low approach doesn't catch the wires you can see how close the nose comes to the parked airplanes this airplane hits the round down and the right wheel comes off This crew member does a good job of running out to stop it. Here's the same approach from Vulture's Row. See the wheel rolling down the flight deck. So this is a very dramatic ramp strike. Lined up left, goes straight at the LSO platform, and is transformed into a ball of fire. Here's the same approach from the left catwalk. Notice the LSO running across the flight deck before the airplane hits and the guy in the catwalk running to get out of the way of the fireball. Very dramatic mishap. The pilot was lost. and I'm not sure how many crew members in the port catwalk were either killed or injured. You can see just how dangerous the Cutlass was around the boat. The Cutlass gets a 7 for ugliness. Its nose is too short and the nose strut is too long, which makes the rest of the airplane seem too low when the jet is on the deck. Allowing that this was the first tailless design, the body is stubby and the wings are too square and the vertical stabilizers are shaped like they were an afterthought. It gets a 4 for mission capability because although it was actually fielded, it only lasted 9 years and during that period 25 pilots were killed and a quarter of the airplanes built were destroyed in crashes. And it gets a 7 for subscriber input as the third most mentioned ugly airplane in the community tab comments. All of that adds up to a mooch tally for the Cutlass of 11. And number two is the XF-85 Goblin. The McDonald XF-85 Goblin was what they called a parasite fighter, intended to provide fighter cover to bombers by dropping out of the bottom of the B-36, which was the brand new U.S. Air Force's signature bomber in the late 40s. Once the Goblin's apparatus was fully extended, the airplane would unlatch and fly around to take out the bandits that threatened the bomber. And when that was over, it would hook back up and then get pulled back into the fuselage. The first time they tried to hook the goblin up, it got caught up in the bomber's turbulence and smashed into the apparatus, which shattered the canopy. The test pilot was able to recover the jet, but it was a total loss. They redesigned the docking mechanism and it worked, but the Air Force canceled the program shortly after that because the goblin ultimately wasn't a great fighter. Plus, instead of the notion of a parasite fighter, ultimately they made longer range fighters that could fire longer range missiles and strategic tankers that could keep them airborne as long as necessary. The Goblin gets a max possible 10 for ugliness because of its shape, which I've seen described either as an egg or a potato, and the disproportionately small control surfaces on the tail. It looks like something that a pop toy figure would fly around in. It gets one for mission capability because it was never developed, but served as an example of what they didn't want to do. And it gets 8 for subscriber input because it was the second most mentioned entry in the community tab comments. All of that equals a mooch tally of 17 for the Goblin. And the number one ugliest military jet is the X-32. 
The X-32 was Boeing's entry into the joint strike fighter competition in the early 2000s, the other entry being Lockheed Martin's X-35. Boeing's strategy to win the JSF contract was to build an airplane that would be cheaper to operate over its lifespan by minimizing the differences between the three versions of the jet, which were Air Force, Navy carrier-based, and Marine Corps vertical takeoff and landing. Their VTOL version had a direct lift system that was less complicated than the X-35s, but required a large intake under the nose to make it work. That design feature, as much as any other shortcomings, is what most experts believe contributed to the X-32 losing the JSF competition. Here's the X-32's chief test pilot, Rowdy Yates, on the, let's call it, aesthetics issue that he addressed during an episode about the airplane on the channel a few years ago. Boeing knew they had a problem with that, if you will, uh, and to address it, uh, they had a little mantra uh, that said, look, uh, you're taking it to war, not to the senior prom. And uh, that, that got a lot of traction. That's the problem. The X-32 is the number one ugliest military jet according to the numbers. It gets 10 for ugliness, mostly for the air scoop, but also for how it looks parked on the ramp. The nose is too high, the main mounts are too short, and the body overall is just plain squatty. It gets zero for mission capability because it lost the competition and the prototypes went right to static displays and museums. And it gets 10 for subscriber input because it was by far the most mentioned entry in the community tab comments. All of that equals the X-32 earning a mooch tally of a perfect 20. And for the record, the airplane that won the competition isn't winning any beauty pageants either. So there you have it, the 10 ugliest military jets. And remember, the mooch tally isn't opinion, it's science. And thanks to all the subscribers who entered their picks in the channel community tabs comments. As you can see, your inputs made a big difference in the mooch tallies. Do you have a military jet you think should be on the list instead? Let us know in the episode comment section below. All right, that'll do it for this episode, and I look forward to talking to you again very soon.